At the time of making this video, the Russian invasion that provoked the war in Ukraine had been destroying the country for over a year. Both military and civilian casualties number in the thousands. Bombs, shrapnel and passing troops have rendered dozens of factories, agricultural fields and transportation lines completely useless. And as you can imagine, all of this has cast serious doubts on Ukraine's economic stability. I don't have to tell you, but war is not exactly cheap. If Ukraine wants to defeat Russia, it is going to need lots and lots of economic resources and if the war drags on, it will have to boost job creation, get its private companies up and running and ultimately get its economy afloat again. After all, war is also paid for with taxes and if the country's economy collapses completely, tax collection will also suffer a serious deterioration. However, where exactly does the Ukrainian economy stand today? Will it really be able to withstand the harsh and constant onslaught of the war? What is the Zelensky government doing to minimize the country's economic damage? Well, today on Visual Economic, we will talk about all that and much more. So, let's get cracking. To understand whether or not Ukraine can resist the course of the war, or at least resist economically, one must first understand what the Ukrainian economy was like before the invasion. And take note, because this is not a minor issue. Although from the outside Ukraine may seem to be an extremely poor country, highly unproductive and practically irrelevant, the truth is that it is not so, or at least not entirely so. Although it may come as a surprise, Ukraine is a relatively important country on the international economic scene. And why, you might ask? For the first reason, we need to look no further than its flag. The flag of Ukraine represents, on one part, the sky with the blue stripe and on the other part, with the yellow colour, the wheat fields. You see, if there is one thing the Ukrainian economy has been known for, it is being one of the world's great agricultural lands. About 10% of the world's wheat, 15% of its corn and 13% of its barley is produced each year in Ukraine. Or to put it another way, if you have drunk a beer recently or if you have gone to buy bread at the supermarket, there is a good chance that the raw materials used for its production have come precisely from this country. However, the economy of this country is far from limited to agriculture. In fact, Ukraine has an even more important sector than that. What sector are we talking about? Well, take a look at the following image. What you are seeing on the screen is the Antonov AN-225. It was the largest aircraft ever built by human beings since it first took to the skies in 1988. And did you know in which country it was built? In the former USSR, but very specifically in the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. Exactly. Ukraine is a country with quite an important industry. Let's say that for many years it was the Soviet Union and then for Eastern Europe, a sort of miniature of what China is today for the old continent. And of course, here we are not only talking about aircraft construction, but above all about industries such as mining, metallurgy, shipping, and even automotive industries. For example, are you familiar with the car brand Skoda? Well, many of its cars and parts are produced in Ukraine throughout an external company called Eurocar. At the same time, Ukraine is also the 10th largest ship producer in Europe, the 13th largest steel producer in the world, and the world's largest sunflower oil producer. That's why when the war broke out, this type of oil became so much more expensive. In total, industry as a whole is estimated to account for 23.5% of all income in the Ukrainian economy. So yes, Ukraine may have been the poorest country in Europe, but its productive fabric has many strengths. So we are basically talking about a poor but industrialized country. And what's more, in recent years, significant progress has been made. But do you want to know the most interesting thing of all? The peculiarity of this Ukrainian industry is that it is concentrated in the eastern parts of the country. And what has happened in the east? Well, it has been where most of the war has been fought. In other words, the richest areas of the country, with the most industry and economic power, have also been the most affected by the conflict. And they have been so not only since 2022, but since 2014. Many factories have been destroyed, others have been trapped behind Russian lines, and at the same time, dozens of agricultural fields, which, as you remember, also play an important part in the Ukrainian economy, have been razed to the ground or filled with with mines. And that is not all. The war has not only destroyed factories and croplands, but has also left hundreds of roads, bridges and highways across the country unusable. Many companies that have survived the fighting, even if they are ready to work, simply cannot do so. Without secure roads and transportation lines, they cannot receive goods or raw materials, cannot ship their products to customers and are therefore completely unusable. Now then, don't think it ends there. Pay attention to the following news story. Russia fires barrage of missiles on Ukraine cities, energy grid. For months now, as the war has stalled, Russia has moved to executing a strategy of attrition focused on demoralizing the civilian population. 
The Russian military has begun attacking facilities such as power plants with the aim of sinking the morale of the Ukrainians and increasing their psychological attrition. Obviously, this is a terrible thing for families. They are constant power outages and cuts in supplies of natural gas or even drinking water. And because of this, the country's business activity has also been hard hit. To give you an idea, it is estimated that 70 to 80 percent of Ukrainian companies have experienced power supply problems in recent months. This has, for example, prevented restaurants from cooking, left factories without power to turn on their machines, or even made commercial ports unable to process shipments and orders from Ukrainian companies. Which, if you think about it, is a pretty big ordeal. Be that as it may, and leaving behind the inconveniences of the war's destruction, there is one last problem, perhaps the most important of all, a problem that has put Ukraine's economy in serious trouble. Take a look at the following graph. What you are seeing is how public spending by the Ukrainian government has evolved over the past months. Since the Russian invasion, the country's military expenditure has skyrocketed. In 2023 alone, more than $40 billion has been spent to finance the direct costs of the war. In addition, the government has also launched substantial welfare packages for families that has pushed the war bill even higher. As we told you at the beginning of this video, war is not cheap. And this is something that has put Zelensky's government in serious trouble. Ukraine's 2023 budget has a $38 billion gap. When the war started, the Ukrainian government began to run out of money. The country's tax revenues were only able to cover half of all expenses, and without money, the war could not continue. However, it was here that the figure of the country's financial savior, Kirillyo Shevchenko, appeared. And who on earth is Shevchenko, you might ask? Well, none other than the governor of the Ukrainian Central Bank when the war started. You see, as the government ran out of money, the central bank started to use the age-old technique of printing banknotes. Basically, during the first months of the war, Ukraine was able to pay its army thanks to the money newly printed by the central bank. Indeed, in this case, they were saved by the printer itself. However, as you can imagine, all of this had a huge problem. With so much new money circulating in the economy, inflation skyrocketed. To give you an idea, in October of 2022, inflation peaked at over 26%. On top of all this, there was an additional problem. In order to pay for the war, Ukraine had to buy many materials such as ammunition, weapons, and oil from other foreign countries. The point is that these materials could only be purchased with international currencies such as the euro or dollars. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that as the central bank printed Ukrainian banknotes, these banknotes lost value against international currencies. So the exchange rate plummeted and therefore it became more and more expensive to buy war supplies from abroad. However, this is something that the central bank was able to temporarily solve by selling its foreign currency reserves to stabilize the value of the Ukrainian currency. However, reserves are finite, and as you can see in this graph, these reserves began to be depleted at very fast rates. So the question is, what could happen if the central bank's reserves are depleted? In that case, Ukraine would have many problems continuing to finance the war. Its currency would become worthless to the rest of the countries, and basically, the country would be completely sold out in economic terms. Or, to put it another way, the technique of financing the war by printing banknotes has a limit, and if that limit is reached, things could get very, very difficult for Zelensky's government. As you can see, the challenges ahead for the Ukrainian economy are very, very complicated. It is not only that the companies and their infrastructure have suffered losses in the millions, but also that their public finances are at their limit. As a result, the country's GDP had fallen by nearly 30% by 2022, the unemployment rate has risen to 40%, and the number of people living in poverty has reached into the millions. But what if I told you that the downturn in the Ukrainian economy might have come to an end? What if I told you that everything indicates that Zelensky's country is set to recover starting in 2023? Would you believe me? Well, let's take a look. National Bank of Ukraine forecasts a decrease in inflation and economy return to growth in 2023. Despite all the difficulties, Ukraine seems to be showing signs of economic strength again. Both Ukrainian companies and the government seems to have set their sights on moving the country forward. The best forecasts point to growth of close to 10%, while intermediate scenarios point to moderate growth of between 1 and 3%. Be that as it may, all indications are that Ukraine will start restructuring and recovering from the economic wreckage of the war. The question is, how on earth is the Ukrainian economy surviving the onslaught of war? How exactly are businesses in the government reacting to the myriad problems that they face? Well, let's find out. Ukrainian Resistance as we have said, one of the main problems of the war has been the destruction of factories, crops, and infrastructure in the east of the country, which is where most of the conflict has taken place. But let me ask you, what if the companies in the east could move to the west where the damage is much less? Well, do you know what? No sooner said than done. One of the major economic restructuring plans has consisted precisely in moving companies, workers, and machineries from the east of Ukraine to the west. 
We took the factory apart piece by piece and put it onto trains to be shipped out. This has given us a perspective for the future. Oleksandr Oskolenko, director of a Ukrainian automotive company, relocated to Lviv. According to surveys, more than 30% of Ukrainian companies may have already started to relocate their production, or at least part of it. At the same time, the Ukrainian government has offered assistance to encourage these relocations. Here we are talking about tax reductions, free transportation, or even reducing the bureaucratic burden in order to speed up all of these processes. However, the advantage of these displacements has not been limited to a avoiding bombs, tanks and trenches, but has gone much further. For example, many of these displaced companies are moving to places like Lviv, places within Ukraine but very close to potential EU trade allies such as Poland or Slovakia. In other words, it is now much easier for companies to start selling their products in these countries, develop trade ties with the European Union, and even import cheaper and better quality supplies from these neighbouring countries. This is something that can undoubtedly be a great advantage for them, and if you don't believe me, look at this. In Ukraine, it's considered cool to work with European countries, so I felt really happy when the first contract was made, he said. For our work, I hate to say this, but it's actually going better for us. Ukrainian furniture trader displaced to Lviv in statements to the New York Times. It is worth mentioning that relocation is not the perfect situation either. Many companies have to face the cost of readaptation, they lose customers, production capacity, but the important thing is that they survive and can keep many jobs. Be that as it may, what about the companies that have not been able to relocate? What about those that have lost customers or are unable to work due to lack of supplies. In this case, the solutions are more varied, but they also do exist. For example, some local companies that have lost their traditional customers have begun to specialize in war supplies. Here we are talking about fashion companies that have gone on to produce military uniforms, mattress companies that now supply their products to war shelters, or even ceramics companies that now manufacture bulletproof vests. You know the saying, adapt or die. And in that sense alone, companies and industries have also sought their own solutions to serious problems such as the lack of energy supply. We see small and medium-sized businesses adapt fairly quickly to power shortages by purchasing generators, batteries, and other equipment, while infrastructure damage remains moderate. Olena Belan, chief economist at Dragon Capital Investment House. In December of 2022 alone, Ukraine imported more than 300,000 electricity generators to adapt to the problems caused by constant power outages. And although not all companies have been able to acquire a generator, others have adapted to by producing at night when there is less saturation of electricity demand or simply changing their production to less electricity in intense methods. An example of this is that many cafeterias have switched to serving instant coffee instead of machine coffee. However, beyond business adaptations, there is another very important factor to take into account. At the beginning of the war, Ukraine was on the ropes and the invaders had fought their way into Kyiv. From then on until now, however, the Ukrainian army has managed to regain ground which in turn has also allowed the country to regain some of its industry and farmland. Well, if we take all of this into account, we will see that progressively many companies have been able to return to business. Not only that, but in the latest business activity survey conducted in December, companies have improved their revenue and export prospects for 2023. Clearly, the Ukrainian economy has not fully recovered. It has still got a long way to go, but it is certainly finding ways to keep up and even regain momentum. Beyond that though, what about the government? What about the worrying decline in central bank reserves and inflation? Will Zelensky be able to raise enough money and resources to finance the war? Well, if you want the answer, pay very close attention. Volodymyr, the bill. Look closely at the following graph. What you are seeing is the total amount of aid that Western countries have sent to Ukraine. But in particular, it is estimated that by the end of February 2023, Zelensky's government would have already received or would be committed to receiving a total of more than $100 billion in direct financial aid in the form of loans or grants. All of this, of course, without taking into account in-kind donations such as arms and ammunition. As we said at the beginning, and we say it again now, war is very expensive. If Ukraine had to pay all of this with its own resources, it would have had to surrender long ago. However, Ukraine is not alone. It has behind it great powers such as the US, the European Union, the United Kingdom, and even international organizations such as the International Monetary Fund that are showering it with money. In addition, many of Ukraine's debt buyers have decided to forgive debt payments until at least 2024. In other words, Ukraine is not only receiving money hand over fist, but will not have to pay its debts for at least a year. Thanks to all of this, the Ukrainian central bank has been able to stop hitting the banknote printing machine. It can now pay for the war with Western money. And remember the graph of central bank reserves? Well, thanks to this, reserves have not only stopped shrinking, but have already recovered to their pre-war level. After this, the Ukrainian central bank has stopped worrying about financing the government and juggling exchange rates, and can now focus all of its efforts on boosting the economy, businesses, and the value of its currency, in addition to fighting the Russians, of course. Its main objective now is to control inflation, and in fact, to this end, it has raised interest rates to 25%. The question is, has it succeeded? Is it curbing inflation in Ukraine? Yes, indeed. As you can see in this graph, everything indicates 
indicates that inflation is moderating. And while it hasn't exactly plummeted, it has certainly managed to slow down and avoid greater evils. On the other hand, thanks to the country's more relaxed central bank, it can now also focus on keeping its banking system in good shape. In a war, the risk of bank failures, bankruptcies, and financial crises is extremely high. And if Ukraine wants to rebuild its productive fabric, it will need healthy banks capable of providing credit and supporting business initiatives. And if not, take a look at the following statements. We believe that the banking system has huge potential for tackling the challenges of reconstruction. Properly capitalized and liquid, the banking system could be a powerful channel for transferring credit for corporates, as well as small and medium-sized enterprises. Sergei Nikolaychuk, Deputy Governor, BNU. And so, visual economic viewers, Ukraine is facing great challenges, don't get me wrong, but with business adaptation, foreign assistance, and a central bank capable of putting things in order, everything suggests that these challenges can be overcome. Provided, of course, that war does not get worse. In any case, as we say around here, the future is uncertain and we don't have a crystal ball, so now the questions are over to you. Do you think the Ukrainian economy will manage to withstand the war? What would you do to boost the economy if you were in part of its government? Do you think foreign aid will continue to top up Zelensky's public coffers? You can leave me your answers in the comments below and let's open a respectful debate. As always, I hope you enjoyed watching our videos here on Visual Economic. Don't forget that we upload new videos every week, so subscribe to this channel and hit the little bell button down there so you don't miss any of the updates. If you like this video, like it so we know. All the best, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.